Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Medisodes. In this week's episode, we're going to talk about a very special class of proteins, ones that are critical to all the metabolic functions within your body, enzymes. Now, you've probably heard enzymes described as biological catalysts, but what more do you actually know about them? Do you know how they function, how they work, and what sort of diseases you can get if they're not working properly? All that and more we're covering in today's episode. And to start us off, I'm going to hand over to Adrian. So, as Anapam has mentioned, an enzyme is a biological catalyst. They are specialised globular proteins that help speed up the rate of biological reactions. For a chemical reaction to start, it needs to be supplied with an initial amount of energy, called the activation energy. Enzymes reduce the value of the activation energy, which means that less energy needs to be supplied for the reaction to start. They do this by binding to the substrate molecules, and give an alternate pathway to the reaction. Reducing the activation energy means that more of the reactants will be above the threshold, allowing more of them to react quicker and thus speeding up the reaction. The specific shape of the enzyme's active site and of its complementary substrates is such that electrically charged groups on their surfaces interact, causing distortion of the shape of substrates and assisting in bond breaking or formation. In some cases, the enzyme active site may contain protons, which protonate the, subs the substrate, which gives it the acidic conditions that it needs to break bonds. Enzymes are specific to the reaction that they are catalyzing and so each chemical reaction in the body is likely to have its own enzyme. The precise 3D shape of an enzyme includes a specific region called the active site, and this is the part of the enzyme molecule with the catalytic function. The active site has a specific shape in order to accommodate for the reactants of one specific chemical reaction. Models of enzyme action have changed over time. For many years, the accepted model of enzymatic action was a lock and key theory. This model proposes that substrate molecules perfectly fit into the active site of the enzyme, much like how a lock fits into a key. The enzyme will then catalyse the reaction, and then the products are released, like removing the key from the lock. This also explains the specificity of the enzymes, because each lock can only fit one type of key. However, it has been found that the active site is often flexible. When the substrate molecules enter the active site, the enzyme molecule changes shape slightly, fitting more closely around the substrate. This is known as the induced fit theory of enzyme action. Only a specifically shaped and specific type of substrate induces the correct change in enzyme structure to allow the shape to change to fit tighter. Enzymes are present in all organisms and catalyze a huge range of reactions. The metabolism of an organism is a sum of all the enzyme-catalyzed reactions inside it. Enzymes catalyse many different types of reactions, some occurring inside cells and others in extra, extracellular tissue fluid or blood. Catabolic reactions are those in which enzymes break down a large substrate molecule into smaller ones, whereas anabolic reactions are those that combine smaller substrates to form a larger one. There are lots of different types of enzymes. A decarboxylase enzyme removes a carboxyl group during respiration. DNA polymerase is an enzyme that combines DNA nucleotides by adding phosphodiester bonds to form new DNA strands. Catalase is an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Maltase catalyzes the breakdown of maltose into glucose during digestion. The digestive system is one of the most well-known uses of enzymes, for several enzymes are used in the breakdown of different molecules in food. The effect of enzyme on reactions can be measured in the laboratory. There are several factors that affect the extent to which an enzyme catalyzes a reaction, including temperature, pH, and substrate concentration. The breakdown of casein by the protease trypsin can be used to measure enzyme activity. For before the reaction, the solution is opaque, and after it is transparent. The progress of this reaction can be measured with a colorometer, or using the time taken to see a cross on paper under the reaction vessel. In order to investigate different factors of enzyme action, the independent variable is changed. For example, when changing temperature, we can use different water baths to incubate the solutions and to investigate how long it takes for the cross to become visible under the paper. 
or we can measure the rate of absorbance change using the colorimeter. pH also has an impact on enzyme activity. Typically, a body's pH is maintained at about 7, with some fluctuations in different parts, and enzymes are adapted for the pH that they operate in. A change in pH could cause changes in protein structure, which then lead to changes in the shape of the active site, which means that the required substrate may not be able to bind, or will bind less efficiently to the active site, which then reduces the enzyme's activity. Excessive temperature, extreme pH, and other factors can impact the change in active site, and thus denaturing the enzyme. I'll now hand over to Shrey, who will be talking about how enzymes are made and transported in a cell. So, as mentioned before, enzymes are proteins, and therefore to produce enzymes we must do protein synthesis. So there are two main stages of protein synthesis, that's being um, translation and then transcription. And there's also after that the modification of enzymes into their final shape. So let's start with transcription. So transcription is using the DNA found in the nucleus, uh, which has the gene for that particular enzyme, and making mRNA. So firstly, the DNA, which is a double helix, uh, will unwind, and that's caused by uh, the hydrogen bonds between the bases in DNA uh, breaking, being broken by an enzyme such as DNA helicase. And then there are free nucleotides, uh, free RNA nucleotides that are roaming around in the nucleus, and they will line up with their complementary um, base in the what's known as the template strand. Um, however, RNA is slightly different from DNA because DNA, as you might know, has four different types of bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. However, in RNA, uh, there are there is still adenine, cytosine, and guanine, but instead of thymine, there's uracil. So there'll be complementary base pairing between adenine and uracil rather than adenine and, ad, adenine and thymine. But that's the only difference. Um, so these nucleotides will line up and will form hydrogen bonds with the template strand, which is the DNA. And then there is an enzyme called RNA polymerase. So as the name suggests, this enzyme whole, basically binds the different RNA nucleus together by forming uh, phosphodiester bonds between them. and that creates a strand of what's called mRNA, messenger RNA. And so this messenger RNA will then, from the nucleus, um, it will go out of the nucleus through the nuclear pores, which will leave these little gaps in the nuclear membrane, and it will bind to a ribosome. So a ribosome is where the next stage of protein synthesis happens, and that is translation. So that's translation of the mRNA into a polypeptide, a sequence of amino acids. So what you find here is that the ribosome has a large subunit and a small subunit either side, and basically these clamp the strand of mRNA, and about six bases are kept in, in, inside the ribosome at any one time. So you may know that the DNA, uh, the DNA code that's used to encode these proteins is a triplet code. That means that three bases code for one amino acid. You may also know that it's a non-overlapping. That means that each base is only part of one triplet and only codes for one amino acid. Uh, these triplets are called codons. And you also might know that it's degenerate. And that means that multiple different bases, a uh, sequence of bases can code for the same amino acid. Um, because there are more arrangements of the bases than there are amino acids. There are about 20 amino acids, and I think 64 different ways to arrange the bases. And this is universal. Every living, um, every living organism has this uh, method of uh, DNA base coding, and that's due to the, probably from our 
ancestors, the la- the Luca, the last universal common ancestor, used this. So therefore, all life on Earth uses this system. So what happens in the ribosome is that there are these codons, uh, these sets of three bases. And around in the cytoplasm are basically these another type of RNA called tRNA, transport RNA. And attached to these transport RNAs are different amino acids. So it could be glycine, it could be valine, it could be anything. And But each one, um, these MR, tRNA has co- anticodons. They have um, three bases attached to them. And, the, and the, what happens in the ribosome is that the three bases on the tRNA match with the three bases on the mRNA to f- and they have complementary base pairing they uh, form a bond between themselves in the ribosome and if you have two of these tRNA molecules next to each other binding the complementary RNA you find that you bring the two amino acids very close together and, and the amino acids will form a peptide bond between them and then the ribosome moves along the mRNA and it it's ejecting these tRNA, but the amino acids remain. And over uh, by repeating this cycle, you end up making a polypeptide, which is uh, basically a, a sequence of amino acids joined together by peptide bonds. And once you've made, once you completely, it's completely translated all the mRNA, then what you have is the primary structure of the protein. It's the polypeptide chain to sequence of amino acids. But now we need to fold it into a useful shape, that active site that the enzyme has that helps it to catalyze reactions. So what happens then is it goes, um, so these ribosomes are on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And what happens is from the ribosomes, they go into the rough endoplasmic reticulum and they're folded up. And they might be folded into alpha uh, helixes or beta pleated sheets. and these are do different types of secondary structure that the enzyme could have. Um, from there, they'll move through the rougher endoplasmic reticulum that we, t- and these are kind of it's kind of like a mem a fluid system of membranes and um, it's continuous. It's quite a large organelle within the cell. And from there, uh, once it gets to the end of this, it will bud off the end of. Um, but off the end of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and what um in a kind of vesicle of its own and it'll then fuse this vesicle will then fuse with a golgi body and the golgi body is where things are packaged uh, for secretion and also there'll be further modification and further folding into its tertiary structure which is the 3d structure of the enzyme and once it's gone through the golgi body it'll bud off that in a vesicle and go towards uh, the cell surface membrane. And how most enzymes are released is by exocytosis. So the vesicle, the secretory vesicle, fuses with the cell surface membrane, and be, and from that, the enzyme is ejected into the bloodstream. And then the enzyme is carried around the blood uh, to the target cell, where it will then go in and catalyze the reaction that's uh, needed. Also, some will not do that, and some will stay within the cell and catalyze reactions that are needed within the cell. So, now you understand how enzymes are made. Let's look at what conditions are needed for enzymes to work properly, and what happens when enzymes don't work properly with anapam. Let's now discuss what makes enzymes work at their optimum efficiency. Many of you probably know already that the internal body temperature for humans is 37 degrees Celsius. But have you ever thought about why it's that specific temperature? The reason is to do with increasing the efficiency of all the body's various enzymes. Enzymes have their own optimum temperature. This is the temperature at which they work best. This is balanced out by the need to not denature under high temperature but also have sufficient temperature so that there is increased number of collisions and that these collisions meet the activation energy required for the substrate to bind properly to the active sites of the enzymes. 
This forms a bell-shaped curved stipe graph. However, the side at higher temperatures falls off much quicker than the side at lower temperatures rises. This is because at high temperatures, the denaturing can occur even just a few degrees above the optimum temperature of each enzyme. And for all the enzymes in the body, the average is around the 37 degree mark. It's important to note, however, that temperature is not the only determining factor in enzyme efficiency. Factors such as pH, enzyme and, and substrate concentration all affect the efficacy of enzymes. Some of these work in different ways to others. For example, concentration of substrate and concentration of enzyme follow a very different graph when it comes to rate of reaction. As after a certain point, the overall efficiency only penalizes the overall efficacy of enzymes. Enzymes, however, are very important in all metabolic processes in the body, and when they're not produced, either due to mutation, overproduction, deletion, or underproduction of genes, this can lead to severe disorders. The malfunction of just one type of enzyme out of the thousands of types present in the human body can be fatal. An example of one of these fatal diseases due to enzyme insufficiency is Tay-Sachs disease, where patients lack the enzyme hexosamin hexosaminidi. An example is Tay-Sachs disease, in which patients lack the enzyme hexosaminidase. This results in the destruction of nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord, and occurs mainly during the early months after birth around when the baby is three to six months old, where it will lose the ability to turn over, sit and crawl. Other enzyme related diseases can be grouped into categories. For example, MPS or mucopolysaccharidoses are groups of inherited diseases where missing enzymes causes the accumulation of complex sugar molecules in cells. This does progressive damage to the heart, bones, joints and central nervous system. And as the patient ages, the symptoms develop even more as more of their cells become damaged by the buildup of complex sugars. Other types of disorders which include the buildup of complex molecules in the body include lysosomal storage disorders, or LSDs, which occur when a missing enzyme results in the body's inability to recycle cellular waste. Depending on how much cellular debris accumulates, it can lead to children dying in very early ages, having symptoms beforehand of intellectual and developmental disabilities, cloudy corneas, stiff joints, speech and hearing impairments, depression, pain, and heart disease. Another category, nyman pick diseases, are a group of inherited metabolic disorders where the body cannot effectively store lipids. As patients with these disorders lack the critical enzyme to metabolize fatty substances, this means a harmful amount of these lipids accumulate in their spleens, livers, lungs, bone marrow and brain. However, these are not the only types of metabolic disorders caused by a lack of enzyme. Phenyketonuria, or PKU, is most commonly caused by a deficiency in the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, and this can cause learning and physical disabilities if left untreated. Others include urea cycle defects, organic acidemias, and mitochondrial disorders, where the lack of enzymes can affect the processes that occur during respiration, which we've talked about previously on this channel. All in all, enzymes are critical to how the body functions, and without them, many of the metabolic processes that occur in the body, from respiration to the digestion cycle, to the regulation and homeostasis of many of the body systems. Without enzymes, none of these would be possible, and as we've just discussed, can lead to many difficult disorders to deal with, most of them resulting in death at a young age. And with that, that is it for today's episode. Hopefully you've now learned to understand everything these wonderful little biological catalysts can do for your body and why they're so important. As well as that, we've covered how they're made and how they're made to work at their highest efficiency. As always, thank you for watching this week's video. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share with your friends and family. 
and be sure to stick around for next week's upload at Friday. Thank you for watching and goodbye.